Leitura do livro Deep Work in a Distracted World, de Carl Newport. A leitura está em inglês. Eu continuo, eu já tenho uma leitura anterior, seguindo de onde eu tinha parado. A leitura segue com o seguinte argumento. We have now seen two strands of thoughts. One about the increasing scarcity of deep work and the other about its increasing value. Which we can combine into the idea that provides the foundation for everything that follows in this book. The deep work hypothesis. The ability to perform deep work is becoming increasingly rare at exactly the same time it is becoming increasingly valuable in our economy. As a consequence, the few who cultivate this skill and then make it the core of their working life will thrive. This book has two goals, pursue in two parts. The first, tackled in part one, is to convince you that the deep work hypothesis is true. The second, tackled in part two, is to teach you how to take advantage of this reality by training your brain and transforming your work hab habits to place deep work at the core of your professional life. Before diving into these details, however, it, I will take a moment to explain how I became such a devotee of depth. I've spent the past decade cultivating my own ability to concentrate on hard things. To understand the or origins of this interest, it helps to know that I'm a theoretical computer scientist who performed my doctoral training in MIT's famed theory of computation group. A professional setting where the ability to focus is considered a crucial occupation skill. During these years, I shared a graduate student office down the hall from the MacArthur, MacArthur Genius Grant winner, a professor who was hired at MIT before he was old enough to legally drink. It wasn't uncommon to find this theoret theoretician sitting in the common, common space, starting at marking on the whiteboard with a group of visiting scho scholars arrayed around him, also sitting quietly and staring. This could go on for, hour for hours. I'd go to lunch, I'd come back, still staring. This particular professor is hard to, to reach. He's not on Twitter. And if he doesn't know you, he is unlikely to respond to your email. Last year, he published 16 papers. This type of fierce concentration permitted at the atmosphere during my student years. Not surprisingly, I soon developed a similar commitment to death. To the chagrin of both my friends and the various publicists, I've worked with on my books. I've never had a Facebook or Twitter account or any other social media presence outside of my blog. I don't web surf and get most of my news from my home delivered Washington Post and NPR. I'm also generally hard to reach. My author website doesn't provide a personal email address. And I didn't own my first smartphone until 2012, when my pregnant wife gave me an ultimatum. You have to have a phone that works before our son is born. On the other hand, my commitment to death has re rewarded me. In the 10-year period following my college graduation, I published four books, earned a PhD, wrote peer-reviewed academic papers at a high rate, and was hi hired as a tenure-track professor at the Georgetown University. I maintained this voluminous production while regularly working past 5 or 6 p.m. during the work week. This compressed schedule is possible because I've inv invested significant effort to minimize the shallow in my life 
while making sure I get the most out of the time this frees up. I build my days around a core of carefully chosen deep work. With the shallow activities, I absolutely cannot avoid batched into smaller bursts at the peripheries of my schedule. Three to four hours a day, five days a week of uninterrupted and carefully directed concentration, it turns out can produce a lot of valuable output. My commitment to death has also returned non-professional benefits. For the most part, I don't touch a computer between the time when I get home from work and the new morning when the new work day begins. The main exception being blogs, blog posts, which I like to write after my kids go to bed. This ability to fully disconnect as opposed to the more standard practice of sneaking in a few quick work email checks or giving into frequent surveys of social media sites allows me to be present with my wife and the two sons in the evenings and read a surprisingly number of books for a busy father or two of two. More generally, the lack of distraction in my life tones down the, that background run of nervous mental energy that seems to increasingly pervade people's daily lives. I'm comfortable being bored, and this can be a surprisingly rewarding skill. Especially on the lazy GC summer night, listening to a Nationals game slowly unfold on the radio. This book is best described as an attempt to formalize and explain my attraction to depth over shallowness, and to detail the types of strategies that have helped me act on this attraction. I've committed this thinking to work, in part, to help you follow my lead and rebuilding your life around deep work. But this isn't the whole story. My other interest is distilling and clarifying these thoughts is to further develop my own practice. My recognition of the deep work hypothesis has helped me thrive, but I'm convinced that I haven't yet reached my full value producing potential. As you struggle and ultimately triumph with the ideas and rules in the chapters ahead, you can be assured that I'm following suit, hopelessly culling the shallow and painstakingly cultivating the intensity of my depth. You learn how I fare in this book's conclusion. When Carl Jung wanted to re revolutionize the field of psychiatry, he built a retreat in the woods. Jung's Bollingen Tower became a place where he could maintain his ability to think deeply and then apply the skill to produce work of such a stunning originality that is to produce work that can change the world. In the pages ahead, I will try to convince you to join me in the effort to build our own personal Bollinger Towers to cultivate an ability to produce real value in an increasingly distracted world and to recognize a truth embraced by the most productive and important personalities of generations past. A deep life is a good life. That was the end of this chapter. I will continue in the next reading, in the next video.